I'm uh, very happy to uh, be introduced to this week's speaker, who is Scott Morrison from the Australian National University in Canberra um, at MSRI. Scott um, was a graduate student here sort of yesterday, although during the uh, three days, 2007. <laughs> His advisor actually in the audience with us today. And uh, here's the topic, and very much forward to hearing about it. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, so this is maybe a bit of an unusual uh, colloquium talk. I don't think I'm going to tell you about any theorems whatsoever. Um, it's maybe more of a, a political talk than a, um, than a mathematical talk. Because I want to tell you about something that's maybe coming and that we all need to think about, uh, which is this business of, uh, of interactive theorem proofing. Uh, so I thought that actually. What I would do is um, get started by actually showing you what it looks like to use an interactive theorem prover. And we'll come back later to, uh, to talking about um, well, other things. OK, so here's, here's the basic idea when you, when you are using an interactive theorem prover. So over here, what is this? I'll get this. I'll get this. OK. So, the, the key line to look at is there's a line there on line five that says theorem, <coughs> infinitude of primes. And there's a colon that says what it is we're going to prove. And it says for all n, there exists a p at least as big as n, so that p is a prime. Okay? And then after that, we have a begin end, just like a slash begin proof, slash end proof. Okay. Now, one or two extra things to notice. Uh, back on line three, we wrote open nat, which means that you said, I'm going to talk about the natural numbers. And if we hadn't done that, this program wouldn't understand we weren't, when we were prime there, whether we were talking about primes in the natural numbers or prime ideals or something else. So it's introduced to real context. And we've also got an import statement up there, which means that we've, we've brought in some pieces of mathematics that people have already thought about and bound through it. Okay, so there's the left half of the screen. And we've got our cursor sitting inside the begin end block. And when we're in that situation, uh, we look at the right hand side of the screen. And this is the computer now talking back to us and explaining what it understands of the situation that we're in. It says there's one goal, and if you read that goal, that's just exactly the, the thing that we said that we're setting up and trying to do. Okay? So it's just reporting that it understands the statement of the theorem that we're going for, and it's, it's ready to listen to what we have to say. What's that H? Yeah, yeah great. Okay. So something um, here I use this slightly compressed bit of notation. I wrote, there exists P greater than or equal to N. And that's just some syntactic sugar for there exists p a natural number, and a proof that that p is greater than n. And so, uh, in the goal of the computer spitting back to us, it's just expanding things out just a tiny bit. But h there is just a proof of the fact that p is greater than equal to n. Yeah. Uh, given it's a political talk, you're allowed to heckle. So. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're in the big. Uh, yeah. Is the fact that you said like there exists a proof instead of just p is bigger than n? Uh, we'll get there later, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So we're in a begin end, begin end block. So we meant to start writing a proof. So let's do that. Um, so what did I do? I wrote intro n, which just means what a mathematician would typically say is let n be a natural number. Okay. And if you look in the goal state, something has changed ever so slightly. If we move the cursor before the intro n, we can see the goal said for all n something. But when we move the cursor after we've said intro n. All it's changed is that, well, there's an explicit hypothesis in our tactic state. Uh, that is, n is now some, some particular uh, natural number, and our goal is to prove that there exists a p and so on. Okay? So it's just like a, the first step in a, in a human proof. Okay. Uh, well, now we probably should think about uh, what our strategy is going to be. And it's basically going to be Euler's proof or something close to, uh, not Euler's, uh, Euclid's proof. I'll go starting with it. Um, but we'll, we'll do the variant with uh, using factorials. So let's let's introduce some stuff. So we just introduce a new number, and so I just wrote there: let m be factorial n plus one. I didn't write an exclamation mark like I usually did. So maybe you can see there's an obstacle to learning some notation in the language here. But in fact, everything is pretty helpful. If I just hover my cursor over fact, uh, some information pops up. So fact pops up. 
And always when you're working in these systems, you can always just uh, put the cursor here and jump to a definition. And you can see back in some other file everything that the system knows about factorials and the theorems that have been proved. Okay, let's get back here. So we declared that m should be factorial n plus 1. And then what's the next step of the proof? The next step is that uh, we should let p be the minimum prime factor of that m. Okay, so again, you needed to know what, uh, what that minfac was the correct way to extract the minimum prime factor, but that's okay. Okay, so, well, we're, we kind of know what we're meant to be doing now. Uh, our goal is there exists a p with some properties, and we've got the p that we wanted to use, so we, we're next going to tell the system to use that particular p. But I'll just do one other thing first, which is just that, and I'm going to certainly need along the way the fact that that particular p really is a prime number. So let's just assert that fact right now. And since it's got to be easy, uh, p was chosen to be the minimum prime factor or something, so obviously it's prime. Let's not actually fill in the proof now. We'll just write sorry. So sorry is the universal proof technique that just lets you do anything at all. Um, but of course, the system flags that your proof used sorry and reminds you that you really better come back and fix those later. But it's very helpful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it's certainly useful uh, when, you when talking to a computer like this and showing it a proof. Uh, you obviously want to give it the high-level stuff first, not get bogged down in the details, in particular details that you know ought to be easy. Uh, so you tend to use sorry a lot when you're just first explaining the structure of the proof. Okay, uh, so now we're ready to say uh, use p. And so all that changed here was that uh, above the use, oops, above the use p, we had there exists p, an actual number, such that some stuff. And after the use p, well, the existential statement has got shorter because it now knows that we're using that particular thing. So what are we meant to do now? We're meant to produce two things, the proof that p is at least n and the proof that p is prime. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit strange that they've written there as an existential statement, but whatever. Uh, let's use the command split which just tells the computer that we want to deal with those two things that we're meant to be proving separately. P is greater than or equal to n, and P is prime. Okay. Uh, proofs should be well laid out <laughs> and structured, and if we've got two different things to prove, we should uh, ex express that we're dealing with one first and then the other. So we do this, and write some curly braces, and inside the curly braces, outside the curly braces, we had two goals. Inside the curly brace, we just have one goal, and an error message at the end of the curly brace saying, hey, you didn't actually deal with that. Okay, so now we need to stop and actually do some thinking. Uh, we've got to work out how we're going to prove that this p we chose really is at least n. And so there's some maths to do here. So what I would propose we do is use a, just some divisibility arguments. So let, oh, no, 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 well, okay, sorry. I forget what I'm doing. Okay, let's do it by, by contradiction. Okay, great. So before that, we had to prove that p was at least n. Now we know this extra hypothesis that the computer named a for us, that p is less than n, and I'm meant to be proving false. And then let's do some stuff, some divisibility arguments. So let's use the fact that p divides m. Okay, that should be easy because we chose p as a divisor of m. And we, sh we should have the fact that p divides uh, n factorial. And again, we're going to write sorry, but secretly we know how we're going to prove that. That's using the hypothesis that p is less than n, so therefore it divides uh, n factorial. And now with those two facts, we can assert that uh, p divides 1. Remember, m was n factorial plus 1. And surely at this point, it's easy. p divides 1, but we already asserted p was prime, and so, so that's nonsense. Okay, so let's not bother doing that. We'll just write sorry to get on with the, <laughs> the, the interesting parts of the proof. Okay. So, okay, uh, what's the second goal? The second goal was just to prove that p is prime, but we already checked that ahead of time, so we'll just use the tactic called assumption, which says, oh, one of the existing assumptions exactly closes the goal that we're currently looking at. And when we get there and close that curly brace, it says, goal's accomplished, you can go home. Except that back up here under theorem, there's a little orange squiggle that says, declaration uses sorry. Oh well, okay. So what are we going to do? We could, at this point, go and construct these little subsidiary proofs of the smaller facts. But that would be boring, okay? These things are easy, and we shouldn't really have to think too much about them. So let's see if the computer can help us a little bit. 
what I'm going to do is just write here by back. So back is is uh, is short for backwards reasoning, and it's just a a, a tactic. So a tactic is just a program that helps construct a proof. Uh, everything that we've used along the way, use and split and by contradiction, were tactics too. And all that back does is tries to do backwards reasoning. It just looks at the current goal, looks at some lemmas that it already knows about, tries to see if one of those lemmas will prove that goal, and if it does, looks at what the premises of that lemma were and tries to prove those, and uses some slightly clever heuristics to decide which lemmas to try, and does a sort of backward search through the premises until it gets something. And here it succeeded. Uh, you can tell it succeeded, well, because there's no red squiggle saying something went wrong. But in fact, because I put this uh, question mark there, that's actually asking back, please tell me what you came up with. And you can see this over here. There's some strange little proof here, uh, which apparently constitutes a proof that P is prime. Uh, so this presumably is the lemma fact cause, you can kind of guess from the name, is the lemma saying that any factorial is a positive number. And then there's, well, some arithmetic about you know, you're not equal to something if you're greater than it. And let's, let's, uh, let's leave back to, to deal with those details. It apparently succeeded. So let's uh, now see if the strategy works. And it seems it does. Okay, back actually is clever enough that it can just deal with all of those little goals itself. It can just look at the goal, go looking for relevant lemmas, and handle it. And we see that actually at this stage, the squiggle's gone away. So we really have at this point got a proof. The computer believes every step of it. Uh, and well, we, can, we could stop at this point if we wanted to. This would actually be maybe an awkward moment to leave the, the file at. You might tend to, in practice, do one of two different things. Uh, back here is quite an expensive tactic. It goes away and does some thinking and some searching. And maybe you feel uncomfortable leaving, leaving that in. So we could, uh, um, just given that uh, back was telling us what it did, we could just go and copy and paste all the things it told us, okay, as, as explicit proofs uh, in there. And that's fine. Now we have an extremely explicit proof of, of our theorem. But we could also go the other direction. We could decide, wow, back was awesome. It could actually deal with most of the problem for us. And maybe we can decide we're comfortable with using some automation to, to write our proofs. And so we could at that stage maybe just rewrite everything here. So I'm just going to throw everything out here. Okay. And write a really short proof. I'm just going to say right away, use the minimum factor of n factorial plus 1. And then uh, I'm going to split. Oops, I screwed up, I think. Oh, dear. Oh, okay. I'm cheating here. No. Okay. Split, split, oh no, it's not going to let me write. <coughs> oh, it's not going to let me write I because of the way I was cheating. Um, okay, oh, that's so frustrating. Um, fortunately, here's something I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the same proof that I was just writing. Um, Oh, because you, you saw when I was typing here, writing the proof, I was typing way too fast for it possibly to be real. Everything was just recorded in a little macro so that when I typed any key on my keyboard, the correct character actually came up. <laughs> but then when something went wrong, there was no way for me to actually be typing. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, so here's the short proof where we've really given just the really, really minimum amount of information. We've said, to prove this theorem, Take P to be the minimum factor of n factorial plus 1. We've now got two things left to prove. That P is at least n, and that P is prime. So handle those separately. That's the split. In the first case, the fact that P is big, do a proof by contradiction, and then just go and search for lemmas and see if you can do it yourself. And the second one, just go see if you can do it itself, yourself. And the computer says, yep, I can handle that. Okay? And so we're done. And so maybe this proof is, in some ways, well, you might prefer this one, because you've only said the, the key mathematical facts and you've left all the boring drudgery to the computer. Okay. No, back straight away would just say, I have no idea. I'm too dumb. Uh, apparently, I can't type at all now. Okay. Um, yeah, no, back would. Back would um, how am I going to do this? Uh, so hopefully, we'll get us back to something usable. 
there. Okay, yeah. So let's just try typing back straight away. Great. And what does it do? It runs for a little while and says, failed. Not very informative, but it just, it wasn't clever enough to find some lemmas that could just handle it all by itself. Okay. No, no, back, back just says, either, either reports an actual proof that it found by backwards chaining lemmas or says I failed. It, it never, it doesn't try to be more informative. So we'll talk about that sort of issue in a little bit. Okay, other questions? I'm gonna leave the demo in just a second. So if you wanna see anything. Yeah, there's lots. There's lots. Uh, I yeah, and we'll get there. Um, okay. Can this produce a proof that someone who didn't know at all what's going on could read? That's an interesting question. Yeah. So um, I mean, I've only tried to show you here a proof. I've only tried to show you the process of writing a proof the computer will accept. To read this proof, either the the short one or the, or the long one. Uh, you really do need to take advantage of the fact that you can step through the proof line by line and see where the computer thinks you're up to <laughs> after each step. It's pretty incomprehensible as written on, on the left. Uh, we can certainly go and look, I, maybe, uh, let's see. Um, let me just pull up one. Uh, just going to do it. Where are we? Um, what's this theorem called? This is one that I hope someone fix up a little bit. Okay, maybe this this is not the best example, but here there's uh, a proof that someone took from Keith Conrad's notes, proving uh, the near independence of characters, and you can see here that the person has written uh, a lean proof that's all uh, that is a computer proof that's also interspersed with some more human readable comments. It's still pretty inscrutable. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll talk more on that one. Okay, let's, uh, where am I going to? Uh, there, okay. Okay, so. Here's the, the too long didn't read. Okay, this is the punchline of the talk. Uh, interactive theorem provers are not yet useful. Okay, you don't want to go away and start using them uh, for most mathematicians. But it's getting close. Computer scientists are building for us some really amazing tools. Mathematicians on the whole are pretty unaware of these tools and where they're going. And I think it's now, the, the sort of the point of this talk is to say that now is a good time for mathematicians to get involved and to talk to these computer scientists and to help build these tools. And the reason is, rough, is sort of twofold. One is sort of help wanted. Uh, there's a lot of work in, in uh, uh, getting these tools usable and getting basic mathematics into them so you can build more interesting mathematics on top of them. But also it's clear at this stage that you can see from the small number of mathematicians involved at this point, the computer scientists are really paying attention and they see what we struggle with and what we can't do and where the system gets in the way and they go away and rewrite the system underneath us and come back and say, hey, now this is easy. Okay? And I think mostly when they look at examples and think about what they're trying to make their systems do, they look at examples coming from, uh, well, programming or compilers or, or, or software verification sort of applications and they don't really know what we even want and care about and having mathematicians at this point showing them what can be done with, already with their tools uh, is really helpful. Question. Yes, political you questions. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yep, yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Na I'll, I'll name names in just a moment. Yeah, so <laughs> slogans, are, that's just the slogan page. Okay. Um, and of course, um, I mean, I hope there are a bunch of grad students in the audience because I know that, that the people who aren't grad students are, are, are dinosaurs and aren't going to get involved. <laughs> and this is just entertainment for them. But this, this stuff will matter in the future, I think. I think. Uh, and it's a good chance for other people to get involved. Okay. So, uh, okay. I'll get there. <laughs> Leonardo de Moreau at Microsoft Research wrote the, the core stuff. Okay. okay. So let me talk about why mathematicians might want to get involved, or some possible reasons why mathematicians might want to get involved. So Kevin Buzzard is one of the mathematicians who's been getting involved a lot recently. He's an, uh, an algebraic number theorist at, at Imperial. And when he talks about this, he really kind of tries to make the case that there's a crisis in mathematics. 
Personally, I'm unconvinced, but let me briefly say that version of the, the why. And I think you can, everyone agrees they can see lots of problems. Proofs really don't get checked in, in a lot of refereeing. There's a giant problem of two appear, uh, and Kevin has in some of his recent talks uh, some really interesting examples of giant multiple book length two appears that will probably never two appear, but yet have vital steps and theorems people care about. Uh, and depending on what field of math you're in, you might worry about the level of rigor in, in, the, in the mathematics that you do and you see your colleagues do and wonder if there should be more of it. Okay, fine. Uh, there's, a, there's a reasonable argument that talking to the computer about mathematics is useful just because you end up understanding things better than you did before you try to convince the computer of things. Um, I certainly find that. Every bit of math I've tried to formalize I realized I didn't understand too well, or as well as I thought. Um, and the, the really interesting thing here is I've now met a couple of students who've said to me, pretty much unprompted, and these weren't students who I'd corrupted by trying to teach them these things, uh, I wanted to understand subject X, so I decided to start formalizing the basic facts in the theorem prover Y. And this is happening out there in the wild. Students are already thinking in these terms. And it, okay. okay, but the dream is that as a result of these tools getting better and us learning to use them, we'll all be better mathematicians. Okay? Now, I think fairly uncontroversially, this happened with computer algebra systems. They didn't make us useless. Some of us don't use them at all. But for many of us, they really did make us better mathematicians. Okay? We can go do experiments. We can go look for things. We can do calculations that previously we would have been afraid of or bored of. Uh, okay, they really extended our scope. Uh, uh, yeah, that that's definitely um, historically been a huge problem in this subject, and the examples I'll share on the next page will talk about exactly that question. Yeah. Uh, the okay. So okay, the dream maybe is that interactive theorem provers that are both good at automation, that is, they've got tactics that can go and deal with all the easy stuff we don't want to deal with, and can communicate back to us that don't just say failed, but maybe say, hey, you suggested uh, the following strategy, but then I couldn't get a bound on K, and it seemed hopeless. Okay, then you might hope that, uh, that, the, that the computer is helping us and, and giving us extra abilities as we try and construct interesting groups. Okay, so there are maybe some reasons why we should care about this stuff. Uh, why should we not care about this stuff? Well, I was showing you in that demo one particular system. It's called Lean. Uh, it's based on particular foundations. It's based on particular software. And it uses a particular library of mathematics that's already been formalized in the system. And we know from experience that there's huge effort translating work that's been put into one system into even the next version of that system, let alone other ones. And there's a huge sunk cost. And there's, there's, a, there's a really scary worry about that. Uh, that said, there's a, what I showed you today was Lean 3. Lean 4 is sort of on the horizon. It's kind of ready, kind of not. And someone just a couple of days ago demonstrated you can import the whole library from Lean 3 into Lean 4. We all sighed a big sigh of relief. But it's a problem. Yeah, yeah, two of you. Okay. The big reason why not, maybe, why you shouldn't want to do this is that it's hard. Okay? The computer is bafflingly obtuse far too often, and it's frustrating and difficult. Still too often the automation isn't there and you just have to write details that a human would just never think about and would never touch. And it's, it's a problem. Okay. Depending on the, the underlying logic you use, and I'll talk about that in a second, I think you should use dependent type theory, uh, you have to fight with that. And sometimes the, the things that the dependent type theory insists you need to prove and you just think, it's obvious. Mathematicians would never even think a question like that it can be frustrating. Sometimes these systems are slow, and you can write a proof that times out. Okay, the software crashes and says, "Hey, I yeah, couldn't cope with understanding your proof." That's not a huge problem these days. Sometimes you find that the mathematics, the way you wanted to tell the story to another human, somehow doesn't fit the the natural um, uh, what's the word. Uh, well, the natural way to speak in these, in these languages, and you find yourself having to do translation. Um, I'll also just mention uh, one, a, a, a continual frustration in these systems, which is doing kind of transport of structure. 
Uh, okay, so I mean, if I say to a mathematician, I've got two rings, R and S, and I know that the rings R and S are isomorphic, and I know that R is a local ring, is S a local ring? You'll all stare at me like I'm stupid. <laughs> like, I mean, obviously you'll realize that a moment's effort lets you unpack the definition of local and move things across an isomorphism and check that S is local too. But like, you'd take away my mathematician card if I tried to do that proof. Like, uh, obviously, no one would have written down what local means without if it, if it didn't move across isomorphisms. Okay, And the computer complains about this and perpetually wants to be reassured of facts like this. Okay, um, okay so there's a bargain you can make, a, 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 a Faustian bargain you can make which is that you can, believe the, you can believe the sales pitch of the people who do homotopy type theory. Homotopy type theory is a, is a beautiful and interesting subject. I like it too. And they say, we've solved this problem. Don't worry. Okay. But you do pay a price, um, which is that you're then stuck in the world of homotopy type theory, and you might not be comprehensible to normal mathematicians anymore. <laughs> and you might have committed yourself to saying everything in the future in a homotopy invariant way. You might not want that straitjacket. Okay. Uh, there are, Did you hear about Vygotsky's claim? Yeah, yeah. That, that was, homotopy type theory means for Vygotsky's claim. actually wanted to do this. He wanted to do this, and many people still want to, still want to do that. Um, Can I ask a really dumb question? Yeah, no. no it's all the good. systems, the, the way they are now, it's not like trying to prove the theorem that I think it's true, but it's actually false. Yeah. Is the system reject that? Are there any... Well, I mean, it'll reject every possible proof that you give of it. Um, it's kind of a mess of saying... Well, there are counterexample finders. I mean, the, the computer scientists really care about that for program verification purposes. Um, but uh, I mean, typically, uh, the computer won't won't come up with those unsolicited, and you're going to have to tell them, "Please now find the counterexample." Okay. All that I wanted to say about Vygotsky's vision and homotopy type theory is that mostly what I'm talking about here, we're not doing that. We're just going to write some automation to deal with transportive structure problems when we need to deal with it, and we're going to try and avoid going down the homotopy type theory. Okay, but the really, really scary question about why we shouldn't do this is maybe it's just intrinsically too hard, and the sort of mathematics that we do and care about, because it's interesting mathematics, not boring mathematics from long ago or... or, or uh, maybe because these systems can't cope, and it's just not going to be possible to do interesting mathematics. Okay. So to decide that question, we need to look at some examples of what people have and haven't done in this world. So here are some examples. And these are, the first three are maybe kind of the famous examples you hear of theorems that have been formalized in, uh, in these sort of systems. There's the four-color theorem. I've written some dates. So I guess the dates are human proof, second human proof formalization in 2005. Uh, there's the Kepler conjecture about steer packing, which again took 17 years of, of, of a lot of effort uh, before uh, the proposed human proof was, was really convincingly done on a, on a computer. And both of those first theorems, what I want to say about them is that basically the theorem comes down to a giant case bash. And so there has to be some decision procedure that you write <coughs> that can handle each of the, the cases in the case bash. And then you need to verify that that decision procedure is doing the right thing. And that's basically the role of the computer. So then there's the order, order theorem, uh, which was uh, formalized a little bit more recently, 2012. Uh, and I think it's another kind of bad example. You shouldn't use that example to sell this stuff to mathematicians, because when you go and look at the order, order theorem, I mean, it's famously long, it's 200 pages or something. But I want to argue it's not conceptually that interesting a proof. Uh, there's lots of character theory. There's lots of sort of minor finite group stuff. But Maybe it's not that interesting. Okay, so something more interesting that just got done very recently, um, the Kevin Buzzard, who I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Johan Tomalin, who's a uh, postdoc, and Patrick Masseau, uh, just recently uh, convinced the computer that it understood just the definition of a perfectoid space. So perfectoid spaces are like recent Fields Metal stuff. They're, they're big and exciting, and I know absolutely nothing about them. Uh, they only wrote down the definition, but the definition, of course, already required that you proved a thousand theorems earlier so that you could even state the definition. Okay, there's, lots of, there's a lot of material that they, that they did in this project. And I want to argue that this one is really different from all the other stuff. It's conceptually way deeper. Okay? You want to have survived 
like all your first year graduate courses at Berkeley before you undertake something like this. Uh, and, and I think that it basically convincingly demonstrates that these systems can cope. They really can deal with the level of abstraction and the complicatedness of definitions and so on that, that mathematicians deal with. There's no, there's, it's not just the software is going to crash before we get to the level that the humans are, are interested in. Okay. This is also interesting because these are actually analytic objects, not just discrete objects. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is all, yeah, yeah. You, you need to, yeah, attic spaces and all this stuff. There's, there's, uh, yeah, it's not, we're not just doing combinatorics here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so here's just a, a random slide. Uh, maybe the most interesting thing is actually the archive uh, identifier, which is the paper they wrote about the formalization and what went into convincing the computer that it understood this definition. And it's actually a really interesting story of the compromises they needed to make, the problems with the, the system that they had to work around and they had to ask people to fix and so on. Uh, but anyway, okay. Here's some, some, the final, the very end of their, of their formalization uh, with another, well, with, with a lot that came before. Uh, okay. Maybe I just won't say anything about that. Looks scary, doesn't it? Okay. Advanced modern mathematics, correct. Okay. Uh, okay. I just want to very briefly say something about the kind of the variety of theorem provers. Um, you've got to pick what underlying logic it's based in. Uh, uh, okay. There's some choices. There's a Merleau Frankel, which most of us pretend is what we actually work in. Uh, dependent type theory, homotopy type theory. Okay. Um, historically, the different theorem provers available have made. Of different trade-offs. They either focus on mathematics or programming. Uh, they either have a very prescribed syntax, or they try and understand just some approximation of natural language. They perhaps either very automation focused. You tell it what you want to prove, and it deals with proving it. It's basically no input from you, so it often fails. Or they're very interactive, where maybe it doesn't help you much, but it expects you to tell it the story. Uh, and I think the maybe the, the the thing that's finally coming is the is a is a, a level a well, languages that don't kind of make too many choices on that, on those axes, but instead try and be good at everything. Uh, you need to have both interaction with strong automation underneath. To do hard mathematics, you need good automation, and to make the good automation, you need to have a language that supports good programming. The prescribed syntax is important, so you can talk to other other theorem proving languages, and you can do. You can, Google can run machine learning on it, but you need an actual language if mathematicians are going to cope, and so on. Okay. The, exa the, the, the examples I've been showing you so far, the demo and the stuff about uh, perfectoid spaces, uh, is all, oh, okay. How oh, am I for time? There's no clock in this room. I should get a clock. Okay. There's a crash course in dependent types, which I think I was, I'm just going to skip over. Um, okay. The, the language that I've been showing you is this one called Lean. Um, you can try it online. If you're bored, just pull out your laptop, go to that web address, and you can run it in your browser. The core language itself is developed at Microsoft Research by basically one guy, Leonardo de Mura. Uh, Mathlib then is separate from the core language, but is all of the mathematics that's been done uh, in Lean. There's a recent archive paper uh, by a bunch of the people involved um, that describes both what's in Mathlib and, and the, sort of, uh, the idea of what it's trying to achieve. It's got lots of mathematics. It's also got support for doing programming in this language, and it also does a lot of provides a lot of automation, lots of tools to help you write the proofs. The really fun thing about Lean that is completely different from all the other interactive theorem proofers is that mathematicians have actually turned up, like me, uh, and Kevin Buzzard and Johan and Patrick and, and quite a few other people now, and are using these systems and talking to the computer scientists. And Lean is, well, I think clearly it has the most active community of mathematicians. There's a nice online forum where you can hang out and say hi to us all. Uh, people are super helpful, um, and it's happy to answer questions from beginners. And the whole library is built kind of the usual open source public review process kind of thing. Uh, just as a vague indication of kind of where it's at, uh, it knows lots. Mathlib knows lots about Euclidean and rings. It knows a fair bit of differential geometry, and it's learning a lot more quite quickly. But there are basic things in undergraduate curriculum it knows nothing. Integral formula. It's, I think it knows what holomorphic functions are, but probably nothing about them. So the, the gaps and the impressive parts very much depend on just who's turned up and, and contributed bits. Yeah. Um, maybe skipping that, but so 
there was uh, I'm scared. Poison on that slide that kind of addressed the question of what happens when the tide creeps into the fault. Yeah. Like, yeah. For example, like Mr. Sullivan's yeah. time, yeah. you end up constructing, you know, exactly. Yeah. Uh, for most people, this, this, this time, I mean, propositions you should think of as a type because elements are the proofs of that proposition. So is prime 57 some type? An empty proof, but for most people, that is the empty type. Okay. Uh, okay. So I just want to give so you. Can I, can yeah, you yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Keep harping on this, but can you say this is the most active one for mathematicians? Yeah. Is the is the Lebowski figure fizzled out in, in, in the end? Uh, no, 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 no. It certainly hasn't fizzled out. Okay. Um, I mean, the there are lots of people who are still who who are using homotopy type theory. Um, mostly, I would say they are type theorists. Who are interested in type theory rather than mathematicians trying to do mainstream mathematics, or the homotopy, or okay, or the homotopy theorists, <laughs> okay, or there are all my colleagues up the hill at MSI this semester. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, now, okay, but would you agree that that maybe most of the people doing homotopy type theory are either doing type theory or homotopy theory, or Dan Grayson doing K theory? <laughs> I don't. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm interested in infinity one category. Okay. 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 I guess I was putting infinity one categories inside homotopy theory. There's algebra. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, 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 this is. Okay. I think Emma, Emma, Emily's answer is a good one. Sorry. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Similar principle. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, they don't you tend not to use lean. Lean kind of uh, decided to move away from the homotopy type theory direction, but there are other other languages. Okay. Maybe what I what all that I'll say there is that. Mathlib and Lean are more explicitly trying to appeal to classical mathematicians uh, than the homotopy type theory people are going. Okay. Okay. Um, I wanted to give some indication of um, of what automation can do for you, uh, and this is a bad example that is going to be a bit hard to follow. I, anyway. Okay. It's a, a cliche, even a literary trope, that when mathematicians turn up, turn up and learn how to use some interactive theorem prover, they immediately start writing a category theory library. Okay. It just, it's just how it goes. And um, I did this too. Um, but my excuse is that I saw that all the category theory libraries people were writing were horrible. And, <laughs> and, and, I mean, and verbose and long and had to sit there proving things that obviously no human should ever think about. And so uh, what I insisted on doing was, uh, was building the automation in parallel with the, the mathematics so that you never had to do anything that a human wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to do. Okay. So here, is, here, the first two things here, the top block is your nader long, and the second one is your nader short. They're both constructing uh, your nader embedding. So the thing that takes a, a category C and sends it into pre sheaves on, on C. And the first one does everything really explicitly. Maybe we can just read the very top. What does it do? Uh, the first line says, well, take an object X of C. And the second, so now once you've taken an object X of C, you're meant to produce some pre sheaf That is some functor from C opposite to, to type. And so then we take an object of C opposite. And the thing we're meant to produce is that object Y, thought of as an object of the original category rather than the opposite category. And then we're going to just to take morphisms from y to y to x. And then the rest of all this junk down here is just checking that that really is a functor, that it really does things on morphisms back in C and so on. You can see like the uh, naturality of something is being checked and functoriality is being checked at the amount of or And the proofs are never very interesting. They like do intros, which we saw in our proof. Uh, they they do extensionality, which basically says you can you can uh, prove two things are equal by proving all their components are equal in some sense. And then we either use the simplifier, which uh, proves this is that, so we can do rewriting by various lemmas. Okay. 
the of that. So we can just all of these turn out. Okay. But of course, you can also write the native short, where we just write the, the key bits uh, using slightly different, I'm oh, sorry, maybe I shouldn't have said this, but the lambdas up there are how computer scientists write the maps to assemble the mathematicians. It's just a function without a name. Right? So lambda x comma something, the function that takes out the so We use a slightly different lambda symbol to tell the computer we're building functors, and we tell it nothing except the, the what, we, what we mean by the innator embedding, and it goes away successfully, does all the hoops of functor reality. And it does much more interesting things. Uh, just to, to continue this example, uh, you need a lemma, uh, whatever. Uh, I'm not going to go into what it says, but if you if you read what it if you do read what it says here, you'll see that it says the absolute bare minimum. It really says, okay, you take this thing and you send it to that. You take this thing and send it to that. And all of the verification that things are natural and functorial and inverses of each other and all that stuff just happens under the hood of the automation. Takes care of it. Uh, you can easily find, if you go look at other people's category theory libraries, spectacular examples of this taking much longer. I, no one gets under a page for this, uh, and you can find people who take 20 pages for this. Um, that's it. What's so, the proof of functor fully faithful? Uh, the, no, this, this <laughs> does exist, but yeah. Oh, well, this is, I mean, this one here is the, is the, um, take is the, Maybe I got the arrows wrong direction. <laughs> okay, so well, how do you do this? So the 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 interesting thing about Lean in particular, maybe, is that it's relatively easy to write this sort of a automation. That is to write programs that help construct groups. And this is new. Most of the other languages are less good at this. At the very least, in all of the other languages, you need to write your automation in some separate language, not in the language you're doing the mathematics. Lean is nice that it's its own meta-language. You can, you can write programs which don't have to be safe, that is, they don't have to be verified in any sense, but which, and those programs help you write proofs, and then those proofs get verified properly. Okay. Uh, I've written there mathematicians can do it, not just language developers, but it's still a pretty small overlap between the mathematicians and the people who are writing the automation. But there's, there's a bunch of this now. Okay. Uh, okay, so some examples. All of the tactics that we saw in our first infinitude of primes argument uh, were, were actually written in lean in terms of lower level things. Use and by contradiction and back were all programs written, written in lean. So. The category theory examples that avoid having to say boring things um, is, a, is a tactic that very loosely follows a proposal of, of uh, and Gowers, where they talked about doing human-style automation, uh, and it, it, it's sort of intended for, for doing follow-your-nose proofs, and for some sense of follow-your-nose. Uh, and I think, generally, there's, there's, a, there's something important here, because the, the computer scientists who've historically given us automation tools have always thought in terms of decision procedures, or, wow, the computer's really fast, we can search giant trees and see if anything works. Uh, and there's a huge amount of low-hanging fruit as a mathematician, sitting down and analyzing what goes on in your head when you write a proof and realizing that those heuristics can actually, are actually pretty simple and could be explained to the computer in terms of the automation that, that is very easy. So Tiny is, is an example of that. Uh, uh, rewrite search is, well, I probably am running pretty low on time, so let me not tell you anything about rewrite search. Let me just show it to you. Uh, where do we go? Um, so here's some, some boring fact in, in category theory. What equivalence is a fool, I guess, is what it's proving. Okay. Is this going to work? Hmm. No? Hmm. I was hoping for something interesting. Okay, uh, let me jump somewhere else. Something should pop up. 
you don't need to look at this. You know, I want you to look at the pretty picture that's supposedly about to pop up. Uh, oh, and I'm so sad. It's not popping up. I have no idea why. Okay, so instead of it popping up and being all pretty and, and uh, animated, um, we'll just jump back to the very first slide in my talk, which was this. Okay, so rewrite search generates these pictures, and if it was working, this all would have been like masses on strings and they would have bounced around and looked really fun. Um, each, each vertex in here is some mathematical expression. Okay? And each edge is, is realizing that, by, that you can rewrite some sub expression using some level. Okay? And what rewrite search is doing is starting at these two points. You want to prove that A equals B. And it's going and searching this enormous network of well, all mathematical expressions connected by rewriting <laughs> sub expressions. And of course, that graph is ridiculously large and contains lots of stupid dead ends. And so rewrite search is doing clever things. Uh, basically, at the very first approximation, it's just doing an edit distance-based search. It's just trying to make the left-hand side look like the right-hand side in terms of how many characters you need to change. How I did this with my calculations. Uh, but it, it then tries to do something a little bit cleverer. It explores the, the, the neighborhood of A, things that can, it can get from A by doing some rewriting. And it explores the neighborhood of B by doing a little bit of rewriting. And then it does some very, very simple machine learning. Uh, very, very simple, uh, and notices that certain tokens or sub-expressions occur over here, and certain other sub-expressions or tokens characteristically appear over here. And so then it decides, ah, those are the things that matter. If I'm going to prove that A equals B, I'm going to have to change the sine into a cosine, something like that, okay? And so then it puts more effort into following the theorem, following the rewrites by lemmas that change the things that it's noticed are significant features of the two sides which is pretty much how I did a lot of my stuff. Okay, so rewrite search is kind of cool, and we sort of used it in the, um, in the MATLAB category theory library to get to avoid doing a lot of boring work. Uh, and again, it's all written in lean itself, uh, and, sorry, uh, and it was in fact mostly written by a student, uh, an undergraduate student, which was kind of fun. <coughs> okay. So, where are we? Uh, some good things. Uh, theorem provers, these kind of tools, are actually kind of fun for teaching. You can, you can let students go with a, a very limited set of tactics and just let them play around and, and look at the tactic state and see what the different steps are doing. Uh, and I, there are, I, I haven't done a lot of that, but there are some, Patrick Masseau, for example, has done some interesting things with his, his first year undergrads. Uh, students love this stuff, and uh, it's a it's a it's a fun source of projects. So, just as examples, ANU undergraduates recently have formalized in Lean those things: three representation theory, theorem stuff about Conway's combinatorial games, CW complexes, grade groups, all that. Uh, there are a couple of examples of real math papers that that uh, now have parts formalized or or that. Uh, exist in the first place because of people formalizing things. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, what's in MathLib, there's a, there's a lot of stuff there, uh, but there are, there are some giant gaps. And so a problem that we're going to face if we're going to start using these things is that uh, lots of work needs to be done getting the undergrad and graduate curriculums uh, into these systems in a usable way. We, we still need way more good automation than what's available at the moment, but there's tons of low-hanging fruit. There's lots of really good things that are easy to write and that will make life easier. Um, and this is a fun opportunity to go talk to computer scientists and talk to computers, um, and, uh, and the logicians and linguists and so on are, are welcome too. Um, I'll maybe just mention uh, three things going on quite recently. Formal Abstracts is a new project uh, run by Tom Hales, where he's planning on taking uh, math papers uh, and just trying to formalize the the well the big the, the big theorems but without trying to formalize the proofs at all so they can be used as building blocks in other places as a sort of semi-formal uh, thing there's a big group in google ai now who are directly using not so much lean but some some related theorem provers where they're running machine learning basically on what tactic what tactic should i try next at this step in the proof and Unfortunately, mostly they're training their programs on extremely boring proofs about simple combinatorial facts or things about verifying programs. And it would be lovely if we could give these AI people 
examples of interesting proofs or, or things that mathematicians care about more. They train on the right things. And there's an absolutely ridiculous project to, uh, to have one of these theorem provers win a gold medal in the IMO, um, which I agree sounds a little bit implausible. But some, some people who've won a great many gold medals on the IMO are involved in that, in that project. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not, they're not crazy. Um, OK. Um, OK, I will stop there. Do you want to get started? There's the instructions. <laughs> anyway. Is that software you're using? Is that like the, the is that some text editor? Is there like a text editor? Oh, that yeah. Um, so this is this is just Visual Studio Code, which is okay. a very common editor. It's got a lean extension that okay. just works and yep, gives you this. It, there's an Emacs mode for old fashioned people. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the question is, is one more interesting math here or, or necessary for boring math to be done by computers. In, in particular, uh, yep. uh, recent paper that I worked on with, with uh, the collaborator, he had kind of a well-known nightmare of sonic is more than well. Yeah. And, and is anybody trying to solve that? I mean, just, right now, the only way to be sure is to ask both. Well, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so no, I, I, I mean, I think that it, it's going to be a long time before um, we're having engaging conversations about the interesting end of the theorems we prove with the computer, yeah. but handing off that sort of drudge work that we know really we ought to do at some point if we're going to believe the theorem, uh, but we really prefer not to, that's where they're going to come in first. Um, there's, yeah, there's not a lot of homological algebra done in, in, in lean, but I imagine... It's a good, probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know too well whether other homological algebra is coming along. Um, yeah, I mean, mostly that, mostly that we haven't tried very much yet. Um, the computer scientists have not really had mathematicians around trying to push them in the direction of doing interesting maths. Um, most of the heavy-duty automation so far has been written by computer scientists who, uh, yeah, I, I mean, after, after this perfectoid project was completed successfully, I mean, I, I think a lot of us worried that that was going to fail and everything was just going to sort of get too cumbersome by the time they got there, but it didn't. <coughs> and I think, yeah, we, we need to put in a bunch of effort trying to do more stuff and see what obstacles we run into. I, I don't really see. I mean, there's just so much of the style of automation of, of looking at what the human does, realizing that there are some key habits that you can, you can describe and just teaching the computer that, and then everything gets a little bit easier, and you just keep turning that crank, and it's not obvious yet where it's built. Yeah. So. Okay. Ah. Um, let, 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 let's, let's talk more later. As a programming language, it's basically Haskell with a really, really strong type system. Um, well, at least everything in the dependent type theory end of, of interactive theorem provers are some form of Haskell and steroids. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, I understand I found most of the questions about the discussion of the search for it. Yeah, sure. Because on my desk, I have this enormous list of categories and a gigantic number one. <laughs> 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 I mean, like, for category theory in particular, it seems like there's many, you know, like many things to check out different categories and so on. Yeah, yep. um, are there some projects for rewriting this kind of number of complex in a way that one can ignore the not being 5,000 pages? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what to. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what to say to that. Yeah, yeah, okay.
little more question is the opposite of the one I asked before. Okay. And so, I mean, many people, I, I guess, Kevin was thinking the main purpose of this is to verify proofs that you're not really sure of. Yeah. And now you know what's true. But, but for me, Matt, what's really interesting is really enlightening concept that if you say, oh, now I understand why and how this thing is true. Can you even imagine a computer program telling you that kind of thing? Um, I would call it a computer program when it doesn't. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll, computer, interacting with computer. Yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll hire them at that point because they'll, they'll, they'll probably expect retirement benefits as well. <laughs> yeah. So the answer is no, you can't imagine it? Or? Um, uh, no, I think I can, but I'll happily hire them as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, by the time if computers get to that point, they'll be so different from our current experience of them. But, yeah. I mean, you okay. One more question. Like, you know, is there a chance that we can synthesize this? Like, is there another piece of math we can synthesize so we can get a new idea of one way of looking at it? Oh, um. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, in some sense, uh, it's a great it's a great target for doing automation and, and machine learning and so on. Saying, given all these lemmas and this proof, can you find shorter ways to do it? I mean, it's good to have um, concrete goals that you can test whether things succeeded or not. Um, I mean, maybe just one thing on that I'll, I'll say is that an absolutely magical thing about these things, these systems, is that um, when you change some definition or slightly change the, the statement of some theorem sort of a quarter of the way through some gigantic development. It is just joyous to have the computer tell you, don't worry, everything still works except on lines sort of 700 and 900, where a little red squiggle appears, and you, as long as you can fix those, it, it's, it's all okay. So the, the, the process of refactoring a proof or just tweaking statements of lemmas is, is a joy. It's amazing when that works for you. It's a bit tangential. Okay, we have to stop.